Yes, it's working. Dear Vice President, dear distinguished guests, welcome and good afternoon. Good afternoon to all those who have joined us here in the room and also good afternoon to our audience joining us online. This is a big moment for me, but also for our European Added Value Unit. Personally, I feel extremely honored to be able to open this much-awaited conference event and to welcome you on behalf of the European Parliament Research Service. Today we have the opportunity to discuss the new edition of our freshly published flagship study on the cost of non-Europe. The study, which has been prepared by our colleagues from the European Parliament European Added Value Unit is entitled Increasing European Added Value in an Age of Global Challenges. In the latest step, it's the latest step in a series of analysis that started in 2012 with the aim to estimate what is the potential, notably in terms of economic gain, generated from joint action at EU level. The research activity has evolved and expanded since that concept of cost of non-Europe came into being several decades ago, considering the trade-off between European integration and national sovereignty. The cost of non-Europe, simply put, measures the consequences of not working efficiently together as the European Union working together efficiently as the European Union by contrast means, making it easier for businesses and other organizations to operate across borders, to allow people to study and work in EU countries, and to jointly anticipate challenges and crises ahead, challenges and crises that may arise in the future and which may need a joint response and not one of 27 individual and diverging voices. That's why we did this study again. It's a study which shows that further integration could generate over 2.8 trillion of additional benefits per year by 2032. To put this into perspective, this is about 16% of the EU's current GDP. And all of these potential gains could be achieved within the current legislative framework and without treaty change. What we are talking about are not just economic gains, of course. They also reflect more social well-being and greater protection of the environment. And, of course, more income and prosperity for citizens. The world we live in is cross-sectional, transgeographically and global. European politics need to respond to this. The study we today present aims to support the European Parliament in this task by helping to define the political agenda and by stimulating debate on a sustainable path forward. We will continue to work in this direction and prepare another publication for next year to spark debate and ideas for setting of priorities and the political agenda. Welcome once again and thank you for joining this conference. Laura Banella, the head of our European Added Value Unit, will guide you through today's programme. But before that, I would like to invite the Vice President of the European Parliament, Michal Smetschke, to join us here and to make the opening remarks. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Vice President. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, uh, and thank you for the invitation to uh, all of the team in the EPRS. It is uh, quite an honor for me to, uh, to be able to say a few words before uh, the real debate the, um, on, on the study and by experts uh, begins. Now, um, the policy conference and, of course, the, the publication is entitled Increasing European Added Value in an Age of Global Challenges, which is pretty long and pretty convoluted, uh, but it, I guess it, it 
conveys a very simple message is that, well, the times are tough, but if we work together, it works better for everyone. And uh, that's always a good argument. And I also, as a national politician, I'm also a leader of a national party back home in Slovakia, these kinds of studies are invaluable, not just here for the parliament to set the agenda, but also for politicians to argue against the Eurosceptics uh, and against everyone who questions the value of the European Union. Um, so, so let us break down the title, of course, global challenges, times of global challenges, nobody would dispute that, and nor would ever, nobody dispute the fact that these global challenges affect our citizens in their everyday life. So it's not just some abstract problem, but, uh, but it's, it means the spike in energy prices, it means higher interest rates uh, for, for people who have a mortgage, it means climate, it means climate emergency, which, which it affects everybody, uh, including in, uh, in our member states. And of course, it means a sense of insecurity given the war in Ukraine. Uh, and this is perhaps, and uh, I cannot conclude without mentioning, uh, mentioning the war in Ukraine, which has indeed been uh, a paradigm shifting event. And our response, the European Union response uh, to Russia's aggression has shifted the paradigm also in EU policymaking. And I think the EU has done well. Uh, I, I would recall that at the time of the invasion or, uh, or shortly before it, there were many who doubted whether the European Union can muster the political unity, the courage to act, uh, whether it can act fast enough. Uh, but now, a year after the invasion, I think we can safely say that uh, Europe's institutions, Europe's member states and governments have stood up to the challenge of Russia's aggression, have uh, in, in enormous speed uh, adopted, which is now 10 package of sanctions, have delivered arms, economic assistance to Ukraine, have offered uh, Ukraine, as well as uh, Moldova and Georgia, uh, the perspective of the EU membership. None of that, uh, I think, uh, were, was to be expected, or no, very few people expected that response before the uh, invasion, uh, and least of all Vladimir Putin has expected that kind of response uh, from, uh, from the European Union. What is even more important is that uh, even after a year, after a very difficult year for our, for our population, the public support for, uh, for, for this course of action is still strong. Even in my country, in Slovakia, which has um, had, had a particularly difficult time because the inflation is twice uh, the rate of the rest of Eurozone, uh, and, and of course we had to deal with the influx of refugees. Uh, and despite all that, the, the support for Ukraine is still solid and remains so. So I think this is something that the European Union um, uh, can, can be proud of. And also the way it changed our own internal processes uh, over the past year. Uh, let's just mention uh, the peace facility, which is now being used to an impressive scale to deliver arms to Ukraine. Again, something that before the invasion was, uh, was, hardly, uh, was hardly possible. Now, and this is the, the crux of the study, is the argument that, there are always, that we can always do more in the European Union, in all, across all policy sectors. And uh, the, the phrase always do more and we can do more is like a politician's way of saying that we failed in something. Uh, but, uh, but in this particular case and in this particular study, it really is mapping uh, where we can do more in 50 different policy areas. Uh, the argument uh, is that we can uh, add 2.8 trillion euros uh, by furthering integration in, in, in all of these areas. And it's, it's a huge figure. And frankly, then the question, if this is so, and we have no way, uh, um, we cannot argue why it is not, then, then how can we as politicians, as, as members of the parliament or as government ministers and prime ministers, how can they justify not acting? How could they justify not deepening integration uh, in these sectors, be completing the single market, uh, or being acting on, on the environment more aggressively, or being, or being in the area of rule of law or gender equality. Now, for the Parliament, I, I can say that uh, we are the institution that is often leading the way, uh, that is demanding more common European effort, common European action. Uh, of course, I don't want to uh, get into interinstitutional, you know, bitter arguments, but it is often the council which is the problem, at least the way we see it here in the parliament. So for the parliament, I can say that, of course, also based on this study, we, uh, we, we think it's very difficult to justify an action. Um, and let's just take it 
climate, it's 125 billion uh, euros that would have been gained if we, if we acted in a more united fashion and, uh, and stronger. In gender equality, it is 153 billion. In rule of law, it's 60 billion. Um, especially, in, and I would like to focus on the rule of law issue because um, it's also something that I've, uh, uh, I've worked on here in the parliament as rapporteur for the rule of law mechanism. And it's something that's not usually associated with the price tag. Uh, my intuition uh, and my strong belief has always been that um, the long-term risk for the European integration project is precisely uh, the fragmentation of its democracy uh, or of its member states' democracies. And it's not just an issue for Hungary, it's an issue for, for other member states and for everybody uh, in the European Union that if we cease to become a club of liberal democracies where rule of law and fundamental rights are respected, then everything else can fall apart. Because every other policy area, every other integration project that we pursue is presupposes or is rests upon the, the trust that we have as member states uh, between each other, and that trust is predicated on the fact that we're all liberal democracies where rule of law is followed. Um, so this has always been my, my worry that if we don't act on the rule of law, uh, we, we, might, uh, we might get into trouble in the long run. But now, thankfully, there's also a study that shows that it brings money. So that's good. Uh, so that's another 60 billion and reinforcing the argument that at least here in the parliament, uh, we, have always, uh, we have always made and we've gained uh, we've gained quite a lot of success, in fact. The, the fact that the European Union has now acted, be it with respect to the conditionality regulation, uh, be it uh, in, in, the, in the form of the annual rule of law report, uh, be it in the European prosecutor, all of, these, all of these ideas, all of these initiatives have been pushed by Parliament, and some of them would not have happened without the activity uh, and without the efforts of the European Parliament. Uh, and it will always be so, that this Parliament, the only directly elected multilingual, multi-party transnational parliament in the world will always, always stand for democracy and promoting rule of law uh, in the European Union. Um, what we need, of course, and this is one of the things where the parliament is very strong, is the high quality research uh, that the EPRS provides. Uh, and this cost of non-Europe study, as, as have those previous uh, studies, is precisely what the European Parliament needs to guide our agenda, to be able to lean on facts and, and the best analysis possible. And as I said at the beginning, it's also crucial for us as politicians when we make the arguments for more Europe, be it in security, being it climate, being it single market, or be it in the rule of law, or even when it comes to gender equality, uh, which is something to, worth highlighting given that we have the International Women's Day approaching, and also something that is not usually thought in terms of figures and price tags, uh, but it is included here and the price tag or actually the money gained from fighting common, or to have a common fight against gender inequality is 153 billion euros. Um, I probably need to close with the uh, famous and often repeated uh, phrase that Europe will not, may, will not be made all at once, and that's of course true, uh, but uh, my sense is that, that over the past year we have made more strides than, than even the most skeptical and, and critical observers would have expected. Uh, and with each legislation, with each uh, new initiative, be it here in the parliament or in the, in the other institutions, with each moment that we respond to, uh, to events such as Russia's aggression, uh, we decrease the cost of non-Europe and, uh, and I hope that at some point uh, we'll be able to cover all of these areas and, and there will be a, a report which says that there is no cost of non-Europe. Um, thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice President Schmechka, for uh, uh, these important remarks. Uh, and thanks for remaining with us uh, 
uh, until uh, 220, you know that you are very busy and you have to leave. My name, uh, let me introduce myself, is Lauro Panella. I'm the head of the European Added Value Unit. And uh, I will be the moderator of uh, today's event. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you and everyone in the audience today, both here in person and online, to share and reflect on the findings from our latest uh, flagship studies, the mapping the cost of the Europe. Uh, you can find uh, the study in back uh, of the room following uh, the presentation of the study. We will then turn to our keynote speaker, Massimo Bourguignon, member of the European Fiscal Board and full professor of public economics at the Catholic University of Milan. We will then have a round table with a selection of distinguished panelists to reflect on the findings and their potential value for supporting the agenda setting process in the EU. Uh, without further ado, I would like to ask my three colleagues to present the selection of our findings from the study. Please, Jerome, Alexandra, and Mina, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you, Laura. Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, let me start by saying, to quote, uh, German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz, that in the time of global Zeitung vendor, the added value of United EU action is more visible than ever. One example is naturally the single market, one of the greatest achievements of the European integration. The costly consequences of Brexit, now clearly visible to all, offer a real life example of the positive impact that past EU ambitious and visionary action has brought. This year, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the single market. It is first a good opportunity to reflect back on, what, on its past achievements and to see what more can be done. A direct benefit of the single market is that intra-EU trade grew significantly from a value of 17% in 1992 to 28% in 2021. As you can see on the slide uh, behind me, you can see in uh, uh, dark blue the level of trade openness in 1992. In light blue, the progress that have been made between 1992 and 2021, and then in orange, the potential uh, for the next 10 years. One of the uh, big benefits of the single market is also that it has helped to increase employment. We calculated that since 1992, three million jobs have been created, um, in particular uh, benefiting uh, uh, women um, and also the single market helped to develop cross-border mobility. Furthermore, the single market had a very positive impact on competitiveness as better integrated EU value chain have developed. Looking at the future, more integration of the single market is possible and desirable. Currently, an EU country trades 45 times more within its border than it does in tri-EU. As you can see on the slide behind me again, the main reason is our excessively complex administrative procedure, the multiplication of different national rules, and low accessibility to information. In our report, we evaluated that further action, as requested by the Parliament, in removing these barriers could significantly boost intra-EU trade with potential economic benefits of more than 600 billion per year. Failure to take advantage of these benefits can lead to de facto wasted welfare gains for citizens and wasted opportunities for businesses. But let's be realistic. Further progress on the single market will require, as explained by Wolfgang, renewed ambition. Moreover, and crucially, the Parliament should be fully involved in all decisions, in particular in the economic and budgetary sphere. And as recently recalled by the European Court of Auditors, of budget instruments should stay the exception. No, the war in Ukraine and the COVID pandemic also recall the imperative for the EU to move away from complacency. So let me finish by saying that one has to be serious. A common budget of 170 billion per year, as currently the case for the EU, is not credible for an actor 
who aims at playing a global role and who wants to continue to lead the green transformation. To reflect more specifically on this, I now pass the floor to my colleagues, Alexandra, who will tell more on the green transformation and digital transformation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Jérôme. Indeed, uh, the EU is a global leader in green uh, transformation, uh, yet there is room to do more and to generate uh, further benefits for the society. Um, at the beginning of this legislature, um, the European Parliament declared um, climate and envir environmental emergency. It called for an EU commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. In our study, we analyzed what if the EU chose the path of ambitious common action to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. We found that taking the path of ambitious common action uh, would bring, as you see on the slide, um, large economic benefits of over 400 billion euro by 2030 and over 900 billion euro by 2050. It would also lead to decreasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 and would generate 2 million jobs and uh, increase purchasing power of all EU citizens. Finally, it would reduce EU energy dependence from external uh, energy um, uh, imports and contribute towards the EU open strategic autonomy. But what would such ambitious path uh, require? Our analysis highlights three key elements. First, we need robust regulations, increasing energy efficiency, increasing uh, renewable energy sources, uh, widening uh, emission trading to, to sectors that are not currently covered. Second, we need an ambitious and long-term financial mechanism for this transition. Third, we need to ensure that all social groups can benefit from uh, decarbonization and no one is unfairly burdened in the process. Now, the other part of the twin transition is uh, digital transition. Uh, the EU has been uh, supporting uh, digital transition, uh, among others, through the Digital Europe uh, uh, program, uh, which has a budget of 1 billion euro per year. However, compared to other global competitors, the EU would need to step up its efforts to address the large investment gap in this sector. The European Parliament has already highlighted that the EU could do more, for example, by boosting digital skills, uh, address, uh, by addressing uh, cybersecurity concerns, and uh, narrowing the, uh, the divide, um, the digital divide between large companies and SMEs. But what could this mean in practical terms? Uh, as you can see on our slide, uh, we analyzed what could be the impacts of several actions. So introducing EU measures, increasing trust in digital technologies, such as cybersecurity standards, more EU support to boost research, development, and innovation, um, as well as greater EU support for SMEs. In total, these actions could bring uh, at least 300 billion uh, euros by 2032, but there could be also other benefits. For example, we, it would make Europe more competitive at global stage, uh, and there could be positive impacts for society, including better protection of fundamental rights. But to achieve this, uh, policymakers should keep a few takeaways uh, uh, in mind. Uh, first is uh, we need to make digital technologies safer and more cyber resilient. Second, we need to ensure that digital technologies are gender sensitive. And uh, finally, but very important, we need to address the lack of digital skills uh, and close the digital gap. And uh, on that note, I will hand over to Mina, who will tell you more about EU action and their benefits uh, on social rights.
Thank you, Alexandra. Indeed, the success of the twin transitions depends on fairness, equality, and social rights. At present, only half of Europeans have basic digital skills. Only one out of five IT professionals is a woman. The EU's ambition is reflected in the European pillar of social rights, which sets out 20 principles to rebalance economic policies with social objectives. Ambitious common action can help make these principles a reality and bring big gains to society. Let's take the spending uh, by, done by member states on social and health policies as an example. Carrying out some of the spending at the EU level could generate important savings, about 50 billion euros per year, as you can see in the slide. For example, implementing anti-poverty measures, such as minimum income schemes at the EU level, could generate 16 billion euros alone in savings. During the COVID pandemic, we saw the EU act jointly for the first time to procure vaccines. And if we continue on this path, we can imagine the EU developing tools and a common institution to support, support joint procurement for all kinds, of procure, uh, all kinds of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and also medical equipment. Altogether, this could help us gain up to 35 billion euros each year and not to mention other impacts, such as better access to health and also lower inequalities. Now, the EU could also do more to promote social rights through its policies. Let's take labor market policies, for example. The European Parliament has been vocal in calling for better working conditions and stepping up efforts to tackle discrimination. What our analysis finds is that inequality whether it be in employment, health, or access to services, in addition to being a problem in itself, it carries an enormous economic cost. Our study finds that our inaction to fully address inequalities are costing us a lot, about 280 billion euros per year, to be precise. Now, gender inequalities, as can be seen on the slide, is one of the biggest components. A key indicator is the gender pay gap, this is the difference in the earnings in, uh, per hour between men and women. At present, the gap is 13%. And if we can continue at the same rate and with the same policies in place, it will take us more than 80 years to finally achieve equal pay. Ambitious common action, however, could turn the cost of gender inequality into 153 billion euros in benefits for society. It would require meaningful investments in the care sector where workers are predominantly women. Such investments, as called for by the European Parliament, could more than repay themselves in the next 10 years, while also promoting health, well-being, and the right to lead a life with dignity and independence. In our analysis of social rights and other policy areas, the common thread and the key message is this. We can gain more when we consider all impacts and their interlinkages when, when, when designing EU policies. And by all impacts, I mean economic impacts, social impacts, environmental impacts, impacts on fundamental rights, and also other impacts, for example, improved global governance. And this is what we, the message we're trying to get across with the Rubik's Cube, which is on the cover of the study. Ambitious common action requires holistic thinking and a holistic approach to step up to the challenges of today and tomorrow. It can bring the biggest returns for citizens, workers, businesses, and society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, so uh, this is the publication. It's uh, a massive book. Sorry for this, but don't panic, because we have also produced an extract. It's 25 pages with the main findings, and you can download it from our website in 22 different languages. So we have also translate uh, the main results. Uh, I expect there may be some questions from the audience, but in the interest of the hearing from, um, from our other speakers, maybe I can't do to hold 
your questions until the question and answer sessions. Now we have the honor to have with us Massimo uh, Bordignon, member of the European Fiscal Board and full professor of uh, public economics at the Catholic University of Milan. During his distinguished career, he has a focus on the benefits of EU action and the potential budgetary waste, and we already had the honor to work with him. Massimo Borgnon, it is our great pleasure to have you today with us, and the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here. I mean, what I have prepared, I have prepared some slides. I don't know if you can see, yes, okay. And, uh, well, it doesn't work. It's always like that, you, know, you arrive at this moment. Okay, it does work, okay. That's what I would like to, to talk with you. So I would want to, to discuss a bit the report and then go to some other the, or the, or the point. But uh, since there is in the interest of time, I'm going to do one thing which is keeping entirely the report. Maybe if I have time, I will say something at the end. And instead to discuss another a couple of, of issues which are related to the report, which we, I think uh, that uh, they are um, quite important. Is, uh, in, a, in a sense, it's also a way to stimulate the debate. I think that the main takeaway of the report uh, is basically the fact that, uh, you know, there might be specific estimation of the cost of Europe, of course, depending on the methodology. You might quibble about the fact if uh, it's really 2.8 billion trillions or 2.7 trillion. But I think that there is no doubt that uh, of a large potential economic advantage in terms of less waste and more growth by investing more in European public goods. What are European public goods? Are basically those kind of points in which there are a lot of in increasing return to scale. So it will be less costly to work to do the things together than doing it separately. And where you have a number of uh, uh, externalities which, which are not uh, internalized, which then can damage somehow, the, uh, lead to less efficient policy. This point is made in a very, how do you say, in convincing way in this report, but it's also been made by several other people in different kind of context. There is also my own work, it was my pleasure to work for the unit, and the kind of result we got looking at some specific field were not very far, very different from the main general result that we get in this report. So, in a sense, we all know that it would be advantage for common action, it would be advantage for all. So, in a sense, the true question is why member countries do not exploit this advantage? If there are such a big advantage, why we don't, we don't manage to make some step forward? And now I'm proposing you three explanations. Of course, I might have my own view, but this is something to think that I think that as European, we should discuss and think about. The first thing might be that uh, the reason why we cannot make a, a step forward is because there is simply too much heterogeneity of preference across European citizens. Maybe citizens prefer to have their own government to do some things because they don't trust the European Union. Or maybe there are such a big difference I mean, among them that they prefer to have some kind of policy inefficient rather than have a common policy than the national level. This is a, the typical argument that, for example, you find in the fiscal uh, federal literature to say, well, you should not really centralize too much. The problem is that this kind of explanation say we don't make progress because uh, Europeans do not, would not agree. That's the basic point. This is very hard to believe because uh, if you look to a number of surveys, like, for example, the Eurobarometer, I mean, uh, quoting the last edition of that, uh, but would not make much difference if you go around and you look to the previous Eurobarometer. Now, if you read the last Eurobarometer, you come up with two uh, basic and important insights. The first insight is that uh, European citizens trust more the European Union than they trust their national of uh, parliament or the national government. I mean, of course, there is a difference across countries. There might be a difference across people, depending on their characteristics, whatever. But the general point is that there is more trust toward the European Union than there is trust toward the go national government and national parliament. The difference on average is 15 points, which is pretty high. And the second thing, that if you ask European people what they think that the European Union should do, the interesting thing is that they come with very similar answer. So, for example, if you ask the question, should the European Union have a common defense and security, the answer is that eight European over 10 will say yes. 
Now, if you ask, should we have a common uh, energy policy, like new question asked in this barometer, the answer is that seven over 10 say, yes, we should make step four. So, uh, and uh, you know, there is also some kind of academic research, which is interesting, a recent paper by, one of the last paper by Alesina, and colleague, that they had tried to ask the question if there is too much cultural heterogeneity across European, and looking to social service, different opinion, on things completely different from gay marriage to, uh, the, um, to many other respects. And one of the basic results we come from there, that uh, cultural heterogeneity is actually larger inside each member country, member state country, than across European, uh, the, the country of the European Union, and that, that, that this heterogeneity is actually not larger, it's even smaller than the one that you find among the states of the, uh, of the US. So, in a sense, on the basis of this evidence, the argument that they say we do not make progress on common action, we have problem making progress on common action because citizens do not want it, is very hard to sustain. The second possibility is that, uh, and this is more, uh, probably a more serious problem, is lack of trust and too much uh, economic and political heterogeneity across member states. Maybe the reason why we don't make progress is not so much because people do not want, but because there is too much heterogeneity across uh, country and therefore even common action might produce losers. Let me give you an example. For example, one of the, the I mean, before Jerome was presenting the result in terms of the common market, and then the result of, I mean, some of the advantage of completing the moral market would be also to eliminate tax frauds and tax competition. Okay, economists, the basic insight of the economists about tax competition is that it's Pareto inefficient. What it means, it means that everybody could be made better off, potentially, by eliminating tax competition, having a more fair way of taxing, uh, for example, company or capital at the European level. The problem is that, uh, you know, the, to transform a potential Pareto improvement in an actual Pareto improvement, you also have to have some kind of compensation. If you do not make some compensation, there might be loser, and this loser might try to stop any progress toward reducing tax competition. So here there is one of the problems we should be find, finding some kind of uh, compensation to make step forward, the one which clearly are inside the, the the, 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 uh, the European budget are not enough. And the other is also that some of these potential comp compensation are intertemporal in nature, and this would require even trust across countries. So let me make a very clear example. I do not think that there is a single general in all the European Union who does not know that uh, common defense, I mean a common European uh, uh, army, would be, on the one hand, much more efficient and by far less costly than 27 different armies, right? But to make this step forward, then you have to trust the other country that the moment in which you need to have this uh, European army is going to be there. If there is no such a trust, to make this step is very difficult. And once that you have a common European army, you also have to have a common foreign policy, because otherwise, where do you send this army? So this is the, the issue, no? Are the country able to develop a, 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 this, this kind of common view and common trust. I think that uh, lack of trust, this is where, what I'm working more as a member of the European Fiscal Board, I mean, is the one which uh, has not allowed so far to make all the progress that we should have done on the European Monetary Union. And the third question, and of course uh, I do have to ask this question being in the European Parliament, is Maybe the European institutions are not effective enough to produce a timely efficiency choice, right? At the end, we set up the European Union 50 years ago. I mean, of course, we have made some change along the way, but still the structure is there. And then we can ask if this structure is the right one, this institutional structure, to allow us to make progress. So, for example, maybe we have allocated too few competence, and perhaps not the right one, to the, at the European level. I mean, and perhaps in the, the common decision making, there is too much a role for the council with respect to the parliament. I mean, the council, of course, is made up by leaders which are democratic, legitimate, they are completely, uh, how do you say, democratically elected, so the legitimate leader, 
but they are accountable to a national constituency. In the Council, they are not there to defend the interests of Europe. They are there to defend the interests of the national constituency. Why in the European, the only the European Parliament is in a sense accountable to European constitution, constituency. So that's another point. And uh, perhaps uh, in our rule, we have allocated too much power on, uh, to the single member state. So even making progress is extremely difficult. So the question here, I mean, we had the Conference of Europe, so we have been discussing this thing. Can we make uh, progress here? Can we reform this institution, or we have to go on uh, on the basis of a path which has been made by now many years ago? So that's the, 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 three, que the three questions that I put on the table to discuss uh, the issue and if we can have make a step forward. And let me make another two point, another point. Another thing which is interesting if you read the, if you read the report uh, is there is also some sense uh, of urgency. It's not only the fact that uh, if we do not manage to integrate to do this common action, we are going to lose uh, some large potential economic advantage. The, the, this is the story. I mean, we also, and this is the, the urgency in the report, uh, we also risk jeopardizing what the European has managed to reach so far. This is the reason why in the report there is uh, three scenarios. One of these scenarios is called the fragmentation scenario. So there is this sense of urgency. If we don't make step forward, we may risk to make some step backward. And so I think that this sense of urgency is actually quite justified. And let me try to give you a, a few, an idea about that. Remember that I'm an economist, so I look at the world from the point of view of an economist. Now, if you look to the economic growth model in the last uh, decade, it has been based on four things, basically. First of all, free trade, what we call it globalization. Second, cheap energy. Third, cheap defense, because European countries had not to spend on defense because this was allocated to the U.S., and then soft power. Soft power I mean that the European Union has become the world provider of standard regulation. The question that we have to ask here at the agency if this model is still sustainable in the current geopolitical scenario. And here there are happening a number of things. There is this escalating competition between China and the US which risks to seriously limiting international trade. The world are decoupling of friendly reshoring. Okay? But this uh, would ma damage the European Union. I have some slide at the end of my presentation. I'm going to leave this presentation based on a recent report of the IMF, which showed that uh, who is going to suffer more if there is this reduction in trade is the European Union, not so much the US, and not even so much uh, China. So clearly, it is in the interest of the European Union to defend uh, free trade. But then the question that you have to ask, and we go to the point if we need, we don't need common action on defense, for example, can the European Union have a really an independent foreign and trade policy from the U.S. when its security depends on the U.S.? And, uh, you know, following the Russian invasion, I mean, cheap potassium fuel energy is probably gone forever, right? And, of course, the European Union, we had before, need to invest more on clean energy. And in a sense, it was uh, ahead of the process. But then uh, you have to ask, uh, now there is also this proposal by the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act, which has a number of uh, a, a, a protectionist elements. How the European Union is going to react about that? Still insisting more on trade uh, regulation, do we bring the U.S. in front of the World Trade Organization, or we do introduce our own uh, subsidy tariff? And uh, globally, we do it for all the countries, we just do it in some countries with the risk of jeopardizing the common market. This is another important issue because this is, uh, you know, where we are playing for the future. And finally, I mean, the use of power makes sense really in a world governed from rule. But is this the world that we are moving on? So, I mean, I think that it's interesting that in a recent paper, Jean Pisani Ferry, which is a key of, uh, very attent uh, observer of the European matter, end up uh, wrote this essay, say that Europe needs to reinvent itself. And to me, I mean, invest in European public goods who should be a crucial part of this reinvention. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Professor Bordignon. Uh, very uh, dense and uh, complete analysis on what we can do more in the future. Now, let's start with our uh, panelists. And as we have seen, the Vice President Suiza has joined us. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us. Uh, uh, you know, she is uh, uh, Vice President of the European Commission in charge of democracy and demography. She has been the first female major of her city, Dubrovnik, I'm right? And uh, member of the Croatian Parliament, and from 2013 to 2019, she served as a member of the European Parliament. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to, to Ms. Uh, Switza. Thank you. Uh, the second person became uh, a member of the European Parliament in 2004, uh, serving as a chair of the Committee on Budgets until 2010, and he became Commissioner for Budget and Financial Programming for the European Commission, and is currently Vice Chair of the European Parliament Committee on Budgets. Uh, give a warm welcome to Map Janusz Lewandowski. Thank you. And the, the third one is a, a member of the European Parliament since July 2019. In, she is now a vice chair of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy and member of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee. She is also served in the Committees on Employment and Social Affairs and the Special Committee on the COVID-19 Pandemic. Make a round of applause for Lina Galvez Nunez. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bourguignon will uh, remain with us uh, through along the panel. Uh, thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to the Vice President, uh, uh, Switzer. Thank you very much. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you already heard, I was MEP myself, and it's always a pleasure to come here to this House and uh, to the House of European Democracy. And uh, my, the title of my portfolio is Democracy and Demography. Particularly when it comes to the subject of democracy itself, we all agree that in today's geopolitical world, we cannot take democracy for granted. This is not a slogan anymore. Many books and studies have been written on how democracy dies. The general consensus is that it dies when we stop caring about democracy. So we have to care. Today, democracy faces a number of challenges on many fronts, challenges that interconnect us all. So we have to care. Today, democracy, as I said, faces a number of challenges from mis- and disinformation to hostile actors using the very institutions of democracy to weaken them from within. And so I want to congratulate you for this report, which we can consider in our work. I fully agree with one of the most important observations of this report. The world is increasingly characterized by interconnected challenges. This calls for a different approach to policymaking with stronger anticipatory thinking. So we have to anticipate things. And the need for concrete tools which help us to better understand future risks and future opportunities. Tools which enable us to develop strategic foresight. Tools which enable us as the decision makers to react quicker, faster, and more decisively when the next crisis develop, develops or the geopolitical situation changes. The Commission's strategic uh, foresight report highlights key areas of action where we need to reinforce European Union policies. We need to consolidate our open strategic autonomy in areas such as energy, industry and agriculture. We must foster the European Union's green and digital global diplomacy. And the management of critical supplies, such as critical raw materials, are all identified in our strategic report. 
as well as key areas like adapting our education and training systems to match labor demand and the need to future-proof investment in research. European integration has been a key driver of growth, peace, and social prosperity. European integration has proven to be the most effective way to respond to present or future challenges. And your science-based report is a significant contribution to this discussion. Science is the best, the most reliable indicator we have of reality. I believe that without science, without research, democracy is unable to fulfill its potential. Science helps us build trust with citizens. Science helps build transparency and legitimacy. Indeed, scientific research and data is the foundation of which my portfolio on democracy and demography is built. From the methodology underpinning the Conference on the Future of Europe to the new generation of European citizens' panels to the report on the impact of demographic change. Our policymaking is targeted and delivering where needed most. It is vital that our policymaking stands up to the task of delivering what is needed and where it is needed. The European Union's framework programs for research and innovation are supporting research on democracy and governmental governance questions. They fund the research in innovative ways to address various challenges. And your report mentions that COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates a demand for more activities at the European level, in particular in the area of the health policy. Indeed, we all know that it was an approach based on science that helped us to cope with the pandemic. This is in contrast to the panicked and self-centered approaches advocated by and which failed, as all of us know. Your study finds that a joint approach to health policy could generate additional benefits of over 20 billion euros per year. The link, this links to proposals, uh, this links to proposals number eight, nine, and 10 from citizens in the Conference on the Future of Europe. These proposals, and your research correlates strongly. You know that we finished our Conference of the Future of Europe with 49 proposals, which all of them were done by citizens, so this is uh, in uh, correlation. There were many skeptics to the process, but the conference has delivered concrete, tangible proposals that improve our policy making. We continue with our, with our participatory and deliberative processes through the new generation of European citizens' panels. The panel on food waste has finished its deliberations. The two others on virtual worlds and learning mobility are ongoing at the moment. In all our work, we are striving to ensure gender equality. Your report highly uh, highlights inequalities in the labor market. You specifically refer to investing in care sector as both an engine of the economy and as a powerful driver to reduce gender inequalities. We have addressed this through our European Care Strategy, which was adopted last year. Uh, it was itself in response to the proposals on health coming from the citizens uh, from the Conference of the Future of Europe. Again, we see how your research and the conference proposals correlate with each other. Your report provides a stark contrast in mapping the cost of non-Europe over the next 10 years. Further European Union integration in 50 policy areas could generate over nearly 3 trillion euros per year by 2032. It can contribute to the Union's objectives in the areas of social rights, fundamental rights, and also the environment. Key topics that connect us all, across all generations in every corner of our Union. This is something I value, because my work spans the whole life cycle, from children rise to ensuring that we are equipped to deal with population aging, as it is the case in Europe, as all of you know. Dear ladies and gentlemen, to wrap up in advance of our question and answer session, as I said earlier, we can never take our democracy for granted. I insist on this because I myself was not born in democracy. So I value the benefits that democracy brings in a particular special way. Your report demonstrates the importance of European Union integration and cost of not pursuing the dream 
of peace, democracy, and fundamental values that it offers. We find the word demos present in democracy and demography. Getting our policy making right in this area is so important for people. Everything about people, everything about citizens. So we must start from the most robust basis possible. Science, research, and evidence. Your report contributes to that conversation. I could say more, but I look forward to exchange during the question and the answers the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this important contribution. Then we will have a chance to ask you a couple of questions. Maybe thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, ask uh, last chair Lewandowski to address our audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your study, which is valuable, optimistic. But apart from the study, we have the empirical case of non-Europe, that is Brexit with all the consequences of Brexit. I think we are not encouraging advocates of exit across Europe to move outside European Union. They are now changing into uh, those who would like to reform European Union from inside, but this is very much about dis uh, disintegration and not integration. Uh, we are living through turbulent geopolitics. War is back on our continent. Existential fears are back on our continent. Uh, we, perhaps we better understand now the peace dividend of the European Union. Uh, probably in the war is more tangible in my country than, for example, in Portugal. Yesterday I was in ports of Gdańsk and Gdynia. Hundreds of tanks and military equipment when moving south and, and east. Uh, a week ago, I was chairing a mission to Moldova. Again, the feeling of insecurity of a country that is practically defenseless against all sorts of provocations and uh, attempts to destabilize uh, Moldova, poor, poor, relatively poor country. War is really changing and adding new dimensions to the European integration. We are breaking taboos. Uh, of a pacifistic by nature European Union. Uh, we are financing uh, military delivery to Ukraine via, uh, and this is here is a really perversive name, peace facility. We are financing military equipment via peace facility. But that means that we are, we are changing. War is changing us. But, but in normal times, at least in my part of uh, Europe, that means uh, net beneficiaries, I, the most tangible, the most the added value of, 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 of integration was strongly associated with the European budget. This is not the biggest budget, 1% of GDP, but has its great value. That is investment, predictable budget, allowing for financing multi-annual investment. National budgets, by their nature, are consumed in the annual cycle. And here our budget is uh, predictable for financing multi-annual uh, projects. So here is the value. But I think the biggest added value is with common market. This is really a win-win situation for, for everybody. Uh, <laughs> more for exporters like Germany, perhaps a little bit less uh, from the countries from Southern Europe. But I remember all sorts of fears spread by anti-European populists, uh, perhaps not only in my country, during the accession referendum. And this was about uh, that foreigners are to buy out our land, of course, mainly Germans, uh, that uh, we are to be flooded with uh, all sorts of agricultural products from, from West. Quite contrary, our positive uh, balance, balance of, of trade with European Union is growing since 2008, even in uh, agricultural products, more than 15 uh, uh, billion net advantage on, uh, in this market. But, well, uh, the common market should be equipped, should, be, should gain digital, uh, digital dimension. This was already mentioned. I think the digital 
Market, Market Act and Digital Services Act were visa steps in good direction. What is the lesson from the war, not only war, but also from Trump presidency and generally our lessons from uh, at the beginning of 21st century? This is about strategic sovereignty with so many dimensions. Also, our answer to the Inflation Reduction Act by President Biden, generally, we need to be more resilient in time of deglobalization. At the end of the uh, 20th century, Europe, old continent, was a new brave world. Uh, Fukuyama was about the end of history. This is not the fact at the beginning. There was nothing of a foundation spirit, new, really new brave world. Nowadays, we are besieged by many problems, by many challenges, neither of them made in Europe. Financial crisis coming from America, migration crisis from Middle East, COVID from China, and now uh, Putin with, with war in Russia. Uh, but I think we are raising to these challenges, enriching dimensions of, of integration. Uh, we are living in less and less predictable world, but what is really easily foreseen are unforeseen events. But this is making more opportunities to prove uh, value added via joint action. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear uh, Vice Chair Lewandowski. It's very, very relevant uh, your experience uh, on this field. Uh, I, I will have some questions regarding uh, budget, but this is uh, for later on. <laughs> uh, now I would like to give the floor to the Vice Chair uh, Garves Munoz, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Please. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I truly believe now as a um, policymaker that we really need to have good research-based knowledge in order to, to develop the best laws and to make the, the best decision. Obviously, I'm coming from academia. I, I was university professor since I, uh, I joined the, the European Parliament. So for me, it is very important to, to find these places we could meet together, uh, uh, improve our, as I say, our decision-making um, process. Obviously, for a person as me, always convinced how important it is to have a, a, a more Europe and uh, excellent um, document as the, as the one we are presenting uh, today is always important. But I think now it is more important than ever before. Probably you think it's, it's a bit too much. But it, I don't think so it's a bit too much because all the time the uh, European uh, Union and predecessor has been ruling, it has been under an international order uh, that was established after the Second World War that has increased or intensified as, uh, during the globalization after the 80s and, and 90s with the same rules, with the, this multilateralism, but this is changing now. It was uh, said before, the, the world is deeply changing. And now we are going towards a more segmented uh, globalization. We are changing the, 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 the profit um, I am, um, well, rule for more uh, resiling. And um, as uh, also Professor Bordignon was saying, um, our institutions probably were made for this order that is now changing. I will not say disappearing, but at least it is uh, deeply uh, changing. So, and at the same time, we are going towards this more sort of uh, segmented globalization, more segmented world. We are facing global common challenge, as you very well know, uh, uh, climate change. We have to, to accomplish the twin transitions, aging, as, uh, 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 inequalities, um, and where size matters and where uh, things are produced matters too. We, we are coming from a world that it, it didn't matter that much where things were produced, but now it's starting to, to matter uh, uh, a lot. Partners matters. 
again, it has always matters. Now, matters uh, 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 quite um, quite a lot. And we are also facing some structural problems and uh, changes in the in this international economy, in the geopolitics, in the in the in the value chain and. Uh, and we have seen that both with uh, COVID and uh, the war in Ukraine, a lot of these challenges or structural changes are uh, accelerating. And in this new order, we are starting to talk about strategic autonomy, open strategic autonomy, not only us, we have mentioned already here as well, the, um, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which is uh, nothing to be with the inflation. It's, it's an industrial policy as such. And uh, it, 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 is, it is linked, obviously, to, to strategic uh, autonomy. And we really need to move on on this uh, strategic autonomy if we want to keep our values, if we want to keep our uh, democracy. And of course, we need to do that in many different areas, as it was also mentioned in health, in energy, raw materials, semiconductors, digital connectivity, agriculture, industry. And we have to do without increasing inequalities that also exist within, and not only which are very important income-based inequalities, gender inequalities, but also the inequalities we uh, see among the different member states and also among the different European unions. And for that, in order really to, to, to advance in this strategic autonomy without advan advancing inequalities, because if we do otherwise, this project will not last because people from different territories will feel they are left behind and we really need to avoid that. And probably for that, we, what we need is more Europe and possibly we need more fiscal union. <laughs> otherwise, the inequalities will always uh, uh, continue. And probably, I agree with Professor Wardignon, probably we really need to rethink our institutions because they were uh, designed and partially developed in an order that, as I said before, it is changing. And just to, to, to finish and this uh, kind of how we could contribute and to build this new world and to, or to be Europeans in this new order, I uh, take the words of our vice president and say that we cannot take the more democracy for granted. We really need to fight against, neither of me, I was not either born in a democratic uh, country when uh, I was born, so I know quite well what that means. So thank you very much, and I hope we could work together. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, um, Vice Chair uh, uh, Galvez Munoz. Uh, now we start the um, question and answer uh, session. I would uh, like first uh, to raise one question to all of you. Uh, Professor Bourguignon said that the EU economic growth model traditionally is based on one free trade, second the cheap energy, one free trade, second the cheap energy, third cheap defense, fourth, soft power. And uh, he's also asking if this model is still sustainable in the current uh, geopolitical scenario. Uh, so what is your opinion on that? I would like to start with uh, uh, Vice President Shimechka. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, the, the presentation, and especially this part, was very succinct and, and I think quite uh, pessimistic as well, because uh, if the question is posed as such, whether a model based on, or a growth model based on these four characteristics is sustainable, well, it's probably not, or at least not uh, in the midterm, or especially when it comes to cheap energy. Uh, I, would, I would hope that we would come to cheap energy again, but it would not be based on fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, that would still be a long road before uh, all of the effects of, of the greed deal kick in. Um, the same for dependence on U.S. Um, on, on US military support and uh, the fact that we don't need to pay that much for our defense. Uh, globalization, I think you answered 
in your presentation, you, you provided us with the answer that the risk for, for Europe is uh, a global trade conflict or deglobalization or rupture in, in global trade uh, between the, the US and China. So yes, I, I, or my answer would be that it's not, it's not sustainable, but I think in some respects we, um, we are on track to, uh, we are I think in, in the right direction to mitigate some of the problems or, or to offset some of the losses, especially on the green transition um, on, on the military side of things as well, uh, we do invest more in defense and we also should invest more in common defense. And this is, comes back to the logic of your report. Um, so I don't think we're doomed, but I think we have to rethink our growth model and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think the, uh, also the goals of the, of the RRF and, um, you know, the twin goals of, of digital and green transitions and, and an economy based on, you know, innovation and, and, and single market and services and digital. I think it's, it's there um, to replace the old growth model. The question, of course, is, and this is another part of the presentation, whether the member states and the European institutions can actually um, make that happen. And uh, I guess that's, that's a question for another time. But I would agree with those uh, the reasons, the explanations which you gave for why even the things that are evidently um, advantages to be exploited by more cooperation, why these are not, uh, why these are not the roads taken. Uh, I would highlight the issue of trust between mutual friends or the lack of trust between member states uh, as, as perhaps the core problem. And defense is a good example. Finishing on that, we can offset the loss of, of U.S. defense umbrella uh, if we cooperate more on defense, because we would spend the money more efficiently. But the trust is the problem, uh, and I mentioned that in my, in my presentation, the trust that emanates from member states being democracies. Um, for instance, if you ask me whether I would want to have an EU army in which you know, the Hungarian leader would be a part of, or Hungary would be a part of, I mean, they are you know, supporting Putin in this, in, in this aggression against Ukraine. So how could you have a common defense, let alone a common army, with a partner who's, not to say, fighting for the other side, but who is the enemy's Trojan horse in our European Union? And you can, you know, go sector by sector, but this is a real issue. Um, so just to, just to close on that, thank you. Thank you. Please. I'm sorry, I haven't listened to your presentation since I was late, but maybe I can provide some uh, thoughts from my side. First of all, when we speak about strategic autonomy, then we are speaking uh, about uh, raw materials, about our industries, about our labor market, and I think we have to push, push heavily into the direction of strategic autonomy of European Union, whatever you may understand under, under this term, because uh, we realize now how important it is uh, to produce, uh, for example, medicines uh, on European soil. We are now having new pharmaceutical strategy. If you know that uh, zero paracetamol is produced on European soil, and all of uh, these medicines are produced in India, then we have to think about, about this pharmaceutical strategy and pharmaceutical industry. This is only one example. When we think about different uh, 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 raw materials which we badly needed for production of vaccines, like lipids and so on. So this is, uh, uh, strategic autonomy is about this, when you ask me. So we have to get rid of uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels. This is our key and ultimate goal. Uh, before the war started in Russia, you know that we set our priorities. And our priorities, first twin priorities, one was, one was European Green Deal, and the second one is Digital Europe. First one, we see now how important it was when the war started, and Digital Europe, we saw how important it was when uh, we had lockdown during, uh, during this crisis. So we somehow anticipated what was going to happen, although uh, this is only my, uh, what I think about this. But of course, uh, we came uh, out with a big, big uh, uh, recovery and resilience funding with Next Generation EU. All of us have to know that, especially youngsters here, that we, we are now borrowing this money on the capital market, which will be given back by 2059. 
So this is the reason why we are talking about next generation EU, because we are now preparing uh, this Europe together with the young people. And this is the reason why we had one third of young people in the Conference of the Future of Europe, those from 16 to 25 years old, because we were talking about their future. They will be living in this future, and we are here to help them uh, with our wisdom, with our knowledge, with our expertise, and so on. So I think uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund is very important. And what I want, uh, want to say is also, because you mentioned the one country, <laughs> I'm talking on behalf of Commission, because you mentioned one country, we are talking about uh, unanimity. Unanimity is great because we are 27 sovereign states, but at the same time, we have problems when we have to bring some decisions and the Commission and I, we are opting for qualified majority vote in order to be faster, to be quicker and to, uh, uh, to be faster in bringing decisions. This is big political uh, debate. This was also debate within the Conference of the Future of Europe, whether we are going to trigger convention on the changing of treaty or not. But this is something which is ongoing and we will see what the, with what the AFCO committee in this house will say. They, have, they will uh, give us uh, uh, their final uh, resolution and see what they think about this. On defense, I'm not, uh, I will leave this to Mr. Lewandowski, but because I, I'm sure that you know much more about this, because you mentioned tanks and Gdynia and Gdansk, but what I know about, as I told you, I wasn't uh, born in democracy and I experienced the war myself in Croatia, so I can say something from my experience, but what I see here, I see big fragmentation in defense industry in Europe, and this is something which we have to correct if I may say so, although we are in free market, uh, but we have to, uh, uh, to, to think about this, how to uh, defragmentize our defense industry. That's all for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. I am afraid that the overregulated union cannot be cheap and fully competitive, and union is overregulated. Uh, in the Luxembourg, but uh, you can see from the windows uh, the statue of businessman. This guy was moving from Great Britain to Belgium because business climate was more positive here on the continent and uh, prevailing over British business climate. But this is no longer true, no longer uh, true. Uh, we are celebrating three decades of single market, single market was born because in the 80s there was a very strong feeling that, uh, that US and then Japan are escaping us, that we are less competitive. And of course, the uh, single market was bringing economy of scale and, and huge, uh, huge advantage. But nothing has changed uh, uh, regarding overregulation. I was a part of Commission of Barroso II, and our exercise, which failed, was to deregulate this was called refit refit exercise but bringing no uh, no real good uh, results and now we have the same feeling that not japan and us but us and china are escaping technolo technologically and with uh, too much regulation we are for sure not that innovative but from time to, from time to time happens something positive namely during COVID uh, pandemia, the most demanded product, that is vaccine, was found, was discovered here in, in, in European Union, Pfizer. And this was by chance also financed by our budget. And this was built by immigrants from outside European Union. So this was a nice positive story. And regarding defense, no choice, no choice. This is also a lesson from Trump presidency. We should be more uh, sovereign in this respect, but our huge potential, te technological and human, is not summing up. And here is the, uh, here is the task uh, ahead of us, because when we take uh, n numbers, uh, Europe is more or less the same number of, of people in army as China. So uh, this is not a question of shortage of human capital or, or technology, but this is not summing up and, and we have no other choice. We have to be more resilient in this respect. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. So um, about the, um, the growth model, I agree again with uh, Professor Bordigno that was based uh, really in this free trade and uh, uh, cheap energy, cheap uh, defense of power. I will include cheap money, especially in the last years, and this is not anymore the case either. Um, so I continue with what I was saying uh, uh, before. Cheap labor, because either because of outsourcing or because uh, we were not as aging as much as, as we are now. And also free care, uh, not cheap, but free by women. So this is also changing because women, we are incorporated in the labor market much more than before. So this is changing. This is important, again, in an aging a continent in an aging uh, region as 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 as, as uh, ours, so um, we really need to make it all that sustainable because all those things are really changing. And uh, for that, again, I think this is the, the the only way. Really, is 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 not only more Europe that I say before. I will not insist on what I've said before. Probably also we need to 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 think out of the box. We really need to take the, so, so I was my, my mobile checking if uh, that, that, that was the, the correct word is blinders, take out our blinders because we have been taking many decisions, especially in very important institutions, central banks and, and others with real ideological blinders. So I uh, don't know what you mean. I mean, not really looking what is really going on, but just on what we have uh, learned in our faculties or what we uh, think is the right thing, but not really enlarging our uh, vision. We really need to do that. We really need to, to think, as I would say, out of the, uh, uh, out of the box. And I, uh, I agree as well with this uh, IMF um, um, uh, report, and there are others, there are a few books already, all of them showing that probably Europe is not the best placed for the uh, new order to, to, to come. We are less autonomous, less sufficient than the US, for instance. I mean, they have this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, but it's not because of that. It's because they have the dollar, because they, they have more uh, cheaper energy, they have more raw materials, et cetera, et cetera. So we really need to, to, to see where we are uh, um, and to, 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 to work. Uh, together and to think out of the box in order we could uh, came up. We have done uh, that in the past as well with more imaginative uh, uh, ideas and definitely uh, with more Europe. Otherwise, probably um, we will not uh, uh, survive in this uh, new order as we have done so far. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Well, I mean, I, first of all, thanks, very, thanks to all of you very much because you took me seriously and you react to the point that I was making at the beginning. And uh, I learned uh, quite a lot even from her answer. I mean, I agree with most of the things which have been said. Uh, just a few things. I mean, I, I, I was not pessimistic. I was not going to start by saying there is no hope. Uh, let's forget about it. It was said that... Uh, I mean, some of the, the elements which are in the report, the sense of urgency, I think is well taken. We are at the moment in which things are changing, and uh, as uh, she just said a second, ago, a second ago, I think we have to plan very, very seriously for the future. Uh, if I have to come up with answer to my own question, which is, of course, uh, we might discuss this is the right thing to do. I mean, let me say like that, uh, that uh, I think that uh, Europe managed to react in a surprisingly good and fast way to the, uh, to the pandemic. I mean, doing new things which were not expected. And actually, the impression that I had at the time, remember that I'm not uh, a policy maker, I'm a professor looking at that, that we were very much behind the corner, you see. Nobody was really expecting that uh, the European Union was able to react so fast, so well with the NGU, but the, the ECB, all the kind of process, everything in the matter of two months. I would have liked to see the same kind of reaction with, uh, you know, the, 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 the invasion of Ukraine and uh, with the energy crisis, frankly. I think that uh, there we uh, lost some opportunity, in the sense that, of course, all country now, it's with some exception, as you said before, are in favor of supporting Ukraine against the invasion of Russia, whatever. But perhaps that would have been really the moment in which you could start to think a bit more about common defense. While the impression that I have is that uh, 
the kind of reaction is, okay, we have to rearm, everybody's going on his own way another time. So here is a, is, is a problem. And even on the energy ground, I think that uh, in a sense that we have uh, lost an opportunity because of this kind of uh, you know, difficulty to come up with a common answer because, and I think that we paid too high a price. I mean, I mean we could have exploited uh, our monopsonic stick position with respect to Russia a bit more. This does not mean that uh, there are no possibilities for the future. There are other things on the debate. Actually, I would like, but I think that we don't have time to discuss even the, some uh, institutional change uh, that uh, might make European more effective. For example, one of the things, since I have worked on that in the past, which uh, in a sense is always mine in my mind, why don't, are not we able to use this enhanced cooperation mechanism? Since we have all this kind of problem of making step all together, as you said before, unanimity is a wonderful thing because we are sovereign. But with unanimity, very often you don't make very, it's difficult to make step forward. So one interesting question that in mind, have a tool. I mean, in a sense, the European Monetary Union itself is an enhanced cooperation, right? Schengen started as an enhanced cooperation. So why don't we try to exploit more this tool that uh, is there? I mean, at least something. Okay, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now, uh, we open the floor to the audience for uh, a couple of questions. Uh, who would like uh, to raise? Uh, please. Uh, just one uh, clarification. If you, you need uh, uh, technicalities regarding uh, our work, uh, please uh, send us an email and we will reply. Uh, how is the methodology behind the, the work we have now presented? And I would like, I prefer that you address uh, your question to our panelists. Sure. Please. Yeah, my name is Doug Surander. I'm administrator in the development committee. And uh, this study is clearly about European governance, governance at European level. I think it's difficult to deal with that without also looking at, sorry, I, is it uh, better like this? Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, this study is about your governance at European level and makes a quite convincing case, I think, for, for more of that. But I think it's difficult to deal with that without also looking at uh, governance at global level. And some small remarks uh, about external aspects have been made. Uh, the fact, which I think is very pertinent, that uh, the European and the US attitude to China are very different. And if you want governance at, at the global level, what to do with China is clearly uh, a key issue. So I would very much agree with, uh, with the point that, we, that that needs to be looked more into. I would also add uh, uh, addressing the corporate income, uh, income tax gap. Uh, which is indeed dealt with in the study, but only in a European context. I don't think it can be dealt with effectively without also being addressed at the global level, further addressed. It has been addressed to some extent, but, but I think it, uh, it needs to, to be further addressed. Because uh, addressing global challenges without having more resources will simply not work. Um, the uh, last chapter of the study deals with uh, with external aspects of EU policies and the absence of, a, of an uh, EU uh, approach of the, in, in many cases uh, to this. Um, and uh, I think one example of where the EU actually is speaking for, for, the, for, uh, for uh, the whole of, of the Union is the World Trade Organization. The Commission could take the initiative to use that role to point out possible ways of making the international trade system compatible with the Paris Agreement and with Agenda 2030 on sustainable development. That's a concrete example of how more Europe at global level could be useful. Two other examples, very short. I, I see you're looking at me and I, I will indeed not monopolize this time. Uh, two other examples uh, related to each other are the IMF and the World Bank, which are not uh, unfortunately mentioned in the study. Uh, we, the Europe loves to, to express its commitment to, to uh, um, a rules-based multilateral order. We are just now seeing a debt crisis in developing countries, and we are seeing anarchy. There is no rules-based multilateral order when it comes to dealing with debts. We could do something about it. 
the EU, you could argue in the study that uh, EU action uh, on, on this is, uh, is possible and necessary. World Bank, to, to, to conclude, uh, everybody speaks these days about the need to reform the international financial system. According to uh, UN uh, Secretary General Guterres, the system is, is bankrupt. There as well, the EU could, uh, could take an initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, very long questions. And, uh, uh, there are another question, another couple of questions. Please. With the glasses. Yes. Hello. So first of all, uh, thank you to the APRS for this very informative study, which I think will be very useful also for the future to engage in the discussion. I had a quick look at it and now listen to the conversation. I, I will raise a couple of questions for the audience if they want to pick up on that. Um, I recently read a paper on, uh, on the Journal of Economic Perspective, which is one of the major e economics journals uh, around, where they were measuring uh, the level of integration in, you know, for the four freedoms, so trade in goods, services, movement of people, and capital in the US and in Europe. Uh, using a very geeky model, a gravity equation, top economists from key universities. And, and the key result uh, was that, in a way, the kind of integration that we reached in Europe through the single market and partly the monetary union is not very far from what we have in the United States of America right now, especially when it comes to goods, services, and capital. A little bit less with people, but it has been increasing a lot. I, I was surprised. This is, it's difficult to measure, but it, it's really well done. And it doesn't surprise me. If you look at the US, they have a lot of regulations that we don't have. States, they are very different. I think in some ways we are even more harmonized already. Uh, so that's what the study says, and that is the conclusion. Then I looked a bit also at these issues from more of a budgetary perspective. I'm happy to see here a lot of people that are very much expert on, I should say, I'm Pasquale Dapso, I work from the commission, so I shouldn't excuse myself. So I looked a bit at the European budget as well. Um, what, we, what is the big difference with the US is the level of uh, disparities that we have within the European Union. So if you look at indicators of economic disparities, geographic disparities between you know, European member states or regions and US states, in Europe, we are three times as dispersed. So differences are much larger in terms of income per capita within Europe across the continent than in the United States. And of course, uh, uh, fiscal transfers are much larger in the United States, about six times larger. So not hugely, but six times is still a lot. Uh, so what this suggests to me is that we have made a lot of progress when it comes to integration. So maybe on the single market, and uh, maybe the diminishing, there are diminishing return to further integrate on the single market compared, for instance, to the European Monetary Union, where a lot of progress has been done, uh, let's say, after the 2010 crisis, uh, but at the moment, it's sort of the European Central Bank, which is uh, sort of keeping uh, everything uh, stable in a sustainable equilibrium. So my question to the audience, it's also within this new perspective of, of EU public goods, which is central, you know, also uh, how do you balance, you know, the presence of this very developed single market and the European Monetary Union that has been developing, but also uh, as uh, there's still some, let's say, room uh, uh, to further, let's say, integrate beyond what the ECB is doing. So there is a chapter on, on this, but I think this is uh, uh, a key dimension. And I'm mentioning this because I, I fully agree with what Professor Bordignon has said on the importance of EU public goods, uh, where you might have preferences that are a bit heterogeneous across member states, so you have to find also a way to move forward, including to the majority decision making. Uh, but what is still lacking, essentially, is that there are still redistributional consequences. Even if you move towards a narrative which is more towards European public goods, we need to be addressed. So how would you see uh, this redistributional issues addressed by moving towards a narrative that is closer to the provision of European public goods? Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, no time for uh, other questions, sorry, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, time is running and... Uh, Vice President uh, Schmechka has already left us. So, 
Uh, we have two questions. One is uh, U.S., more or less, and the other one is on governance. So, uh, do only, you have a few only, words only, on few, only a few words, because both questions were so important that we need another panel, so we cannot, <laughs> we cannot reply to these questions I would like in, to in, a, you to the in, next one, in a few minutes, next. because it was very interesting to listen to you and uh, to listen to your analysis in the end. And uh, it's, um, if you, uh, I'm trying to refer to the last one, uh, comparison between U.S. and the and the U and European Union, uh, the very idea that we are 27 and that we are 27, di 24 different languages, 27 different uh, systems. So, of, o although all of us are democracies, but still, uh, it's not easy to compare. But we are always looking for our allies, and our transatlantic alliance is uh, very important. At this moment, as you know, we have this Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act. We are trying to iron uh, the, uh, some issues in this Inflation Reduction Act, trying to uh, make uh, uh, our alliance uh, even stronger, because as, as we see uh, geopolitically, we have to stay together. Regarding uh, governance, it's uh, not easy to reply to this question. You were mentioning also local governance. It's local, regional, national, then uh, European, uh, different competencies according to treaty. To treaty. So it's a mix of competencies, sometimes interference, sometimes member states ask us to help to interfere. Sometimes member states think that we are interfering a lot. So it's a huge uh, uh, issue. So I'm not sure that uh, we will have enough time to uh, go deeper into this debate. So thank you very much for your interest, but for next time, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Fortunately, we were listening to comments and not necessarily questions, but that is, uh, that is my at least impression. Uh, Europe is about daily management of diversity. This is not a federal state. Therefore, our reactions cannot be the same. Our governments cannot be the same um, as on the other side of the Atlantic. I agree with Professor that perhaps we have uh, not enough of enhanced cooperation, if they will, if they are volunteers. I was proposing a financial transaction tax uh, many years ago, and it failed. It was a test of enhanced cooperation, but without much success. I'm afraid that this is not good for the parliament, that we are so many crisis situations that we are to react quickly. And ad hoc solutions are mainly intergovernmental, but are not community uh, solutions. This was like with, with financial crisis. Uh, several facilities um, done in, as intergovernmental bodies, some of them changed into stable uh, European institution. This was the same with uh, surprisingly uh, rapid reaction to pandemia, although health service is not is national competence, but somehow the, we see beginning of health union, although this is not quite in, in the treaty. The same with, with new generation fund, ad hoc uh, giant solution, giant enterprise, but without much say of the European Parliament. So we are reacting quickly, surprisingly, but this is not so advantageous for the European Parliament. Thank you. So thank you very, very, very quick. Um, I will react to this uh, comparison of US, US, uh, EU. Obviously, we are not comparing the same things. So that's the first uh, issue. We are not, we are not uh, a federal uh, state. It is true that you say that integration is not as far from the US, but inequality is bigger. That is normal. It is absolutely normal. We don't have uh, uh, the same common budget. Uh, Ours is much smaller than the, the US one. And they have, sorry to insist again, they have a fiscal union to match their monetary union. Uh, we don't. We have a monetary union without a fiscal union, and that creates a lot of inequalities. There are a lot of studies, a lot of very well-known economists showing that uh, it was, um, 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 let's say, not uh, finished 
uh, uh, union or not well-defined union in the, in the sense that it's not a fiscal union. But it is very difficult because we are not a federal state. So that to, to, to go for a fiscal union is going to be difficult, although probably it will be uh, 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 necessary. And probably that's the, the way we, we advance also in redistribu redistribution. We think a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act, but one thing we don't say normally about the Inflation Reduct Reduction Act is that it is especially investing in areas that were disindustrialized. So in, in, in not in the, in the most dynamic areas, it is uh, investing in these more depressed areas in order to reduce more inequalities and political divide. So this is something probably it is good from this Inflation Reduction Act we are not normally looking at. Very quickly, um, the, you are saying that income tax and everything should be universal. Yes, of course, all these uh, rules should be universal, but uh, I think what we are moving away now from these universal rules. We were during few years since China uh, get into the World Trade Organization, it was one world, two rules. But probably we are moving towards now few worlds and probably few rules. So that's the, the, the scenario we need to face. And in these new scenarios where we need to take our decisions and to be brave, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know if I, do I, I also have to answer it. Uh, just two quick points. Uh, uh, the European Union is not a federal state, it has been said, so this kind of comparison is difficult to make, but I do think that uh, we had to move a bit in that direction. It doesn't mean that you had to have to become a, a fully-fledged federal state, but I think that this kind of social dimension, inequality, fiscal policy, I think these are part that, uh, to me, is difficult to see how you can advance if you don't put a bit more on, on, on that ground. And uh, reacting to the, to the point you were making, uh, a good point. I think that, uh, in a sense, we had done more progress on the common market than many other fields. But still, it's still impressive that if you look to the data, I mean, to this report, I mean, most of uh, the, uh, the, adv the economic advantage will come up with this common action still is in the common market. So there is still a lot of work to be done there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me just a few words to conclude. Um, as we have seen, we are facing relevant challenges and the reply at EU level is important. As you have uh, uh, just said, the EU common action is very important. I would like to thank you for having accepted our invitation to be here today and I would like to thank the audience here in presence and online for having spent a couple of hours with us. We are working in the next, for the next edition of this Mapping the Cost of Europe. We will hope to be able to publish it in February next year ahead of the electoral campaign for the European Parliament. Thank you very much and see you soon.